One, two, three, four, get my shoes and out the door. Five, I'm alive, six, seven, eight, feeling great. Nine, I'm gonna shine, life is good. I'm doing five, ten, gonna do it right and do it again, yeah. I look into the sky with all the beautiful color, but there's more than just for me, so gonna share it with another. I got to show, to give, let out, I want to sing and shout. Take a look and see a beautiful morning that turns into a beautiful evening. And together make a beautiful life. And if you wanna see, then come along with me. Welcome to another episode of Experience Michiana, and we have a special one for you today as we're celebrating sustainability in the Michiana area. And the way that we're doing that is with Krista Bailey, who has for a number of years now brought us Experiencing Sustainable Michiana, right? That's right. That's right. And this has been a passion project for you for a really long time, uh, bringing awareness to others as far as what's out there and what they can do. Absolutely, I see it as part of my outreach work um, at the Center for a Sustainable Future at IU South Bend to be providing this kind of education and insight to the community, but also the campus. I use a lot of these pieces in my classes to show students it's really happening. <laughs> it's not just me talking about it. Right, and the reason that we're doing this best of show right now is because Unfortunately for us, Krista has accepted a position at Penn State, and so you'll be leaving the area soon. That's right. I'll be working at the Sustainability Institute, working um, across the whole state, actually, with campuses across the state to advance sustainability. So uh, maybe connecting with the PBS station here and there, but we'll see. There you go. Yeah. So what we want to do today is look back a little bit at what we've recently done with sustainability in experiencing Michiana. Um, but first, uh, let's reminisce a little bit about your history with WINP Public Television. The first time I met you, uh, we were doing a segment with Evie Kirkwood and Outdoor Elements in the gardens behind the oh. conservatory <laughs> <Yeah>. uh, <laughs> there at Potawatomi. And, right. and so that was kind of that kickstart of, hey, let's tell people about what's going on. Yeah, that was even before I started working at, at IU. Um, I was just had started a community garden that's still operating. It's going to keep going even when I leave, which is exciting. Um, you know, saying, hey, get out, grow stuff. Uh, yeah, that was fun. I forgot that was the first time. Yeah, and from there, we went, when Experience Michiana started, uh, for those of you who remember, we were a studio-based show, and it was five days a week. And so one of the things we wanted to do is bring sustainability to you. And at that point, you were at the center. Uh, working with Mike Keene and the two mm -hmm. of you brought us sustainability segments uh, pretty much every week. Yeah, we would just kind of stand here in the studio somewhat awkwardly and try to chat with people about what they were doing and what people could, could see out in the community. So, but we had never really went out until more recently. Yeah, and because the show changed and yeah. in between there, uh, you were uh, kind enough to host uh, Outdoor Elements with us for a couple of years uh, okay. with Evie Kirkwood and, um, and we did that. And then when this show changed formats, it made sense for that sustainability to pull right in uh, to Experience Michiana and we've had fun ever since. So tell us some of your favorite opportunities and experiences in segments here on Experience Michiana. Oh gosh, um, well there's definitely a lot of opportunities to get out and explore this area. We're one of the most biodiverse regions in the country. If you think about going from here to Lake Michigan and all the things you can see in between, lots of uh, features we've done about that. Um, and things that are happening in city parks as well, which is super exciting to see the sustainability initiatives, whether it's what you're growing or what the buildings look like. Um, of course, lots of good food to eat, um, locally sourced things, um, people doing really creative work in restaurants to make a healthy, vibrant, prosperous situation for the business, but also for the communities that they're situated in. Um, and just like some fun outdoor activities. We went snowshoeing once, mm. I, I think. Um, uh, so that was exciting also. Yeah, we've had a, a great opportunity. That's what Experience Michiana does as a whole. It brings you things that you might not have known were in our area. We talk about that all the time. A lot of people say there's nothing to do. That's not true. Yeah, as soon know. as we start looking, there's so much to do in the area. and. We also don't recognize some of the things that are happen happening with sustainability in our area until we shine a light on them, and you've been able to do that for us. Yeah, and that's been so fun because there really is a lot happening in our area, but we're such you know, modest Midwestern people. We tend not to brag about it, um, but it's there. Uh, places, uh, whether they're, they're parks or businesses or what governments are doing to take a balanced approach to caring for the environment, uh, our health and our culture, 
and making sure that we have a prosperous economy. So balancing all three of those, it's happening all over the place. Um, it, it's been really exciting to, to pull those up and to, to share with people. And great to hear from folks that I've seen around town saying, wow, I, I never realized there was that thing or that was happening or, or why that's important. So it's been a lot of fun. So thanks so much for the opportunity to share all these great stories with people. It really has been our pleasure. And right now what we're gonna do is we're gonna look back at some of Krista's favorite segments uh, over the last couple years and to just kind of highlight those. Not gonna be able to show the whole segment, but here's a, a bunch of the, the different segments that we've really enjoyed bringing to you over the last few years. Hi there. Hey, Marianne. How Good to are see you? you. Good Good to see thanks see for you having too. me today. Hey, no problem. Welcome. You have a lot of stuff right here. We so do. Walking into the, the swap shop depot <laughs> area. Yes. What could I experience right here in terms of wow. sustainability in action? Well, um, we are the Marshall County Solid Waste Management District and also known as the Recycle Depot. We collect household hazardous waste and then we also help people learn how to live more sustainably. So here are some um, things that we like to teach people about, um, mostly pertaining to waste. For instance, um, uh, we teach people about composting. Oh. You know, a lot of times people think, I can't compost, I don't have enough space, <laughs> or I don't have enough food, or I don't have a big mm. garden. But there are a lot of different ways to compost. Food waste is a big problem. It's a big problem in landfills. It's a big problem in the world. Absolutely. So, um, we have uh, items like this, which is a way of composting, especially if you're in a really small place. Um, we also have compost bins. This is my favorite. This is the one I have. So if you have a garden, this fits right into the corner of your yard, and you can put your food waste and your yard waste in there. Um, we also have, this is a model of a tumbler, a homemade compost tumbler, which is just a a way to mix your compost the easy way. Yeah, this is what I've got, and I, okay. I love it. I think it's a lot of fun. So yeah. what else are we experiencing here as we're walking and I'm seeing the big barrels, those are obvious, but what yeah. other sort of sustainability features are we experiencing here in, in, in your swap shop depot? <laughs> uh, well, one thing, one program that we have is a program where we um, we take caps, like like bottle caps and other types of plastic caps and we work with a factory in Evansville and they turn them into benches. So this is a bench really? made of- It's a beautiful bench. It's made of completely recycled caps and lids. So that's a program we offer with nonprofits here in Marshall County, nice. which is exciting. This is called household hazardous waste and this is the type of waste that should not ever be thrown away because it's it's got a lot of chemicals, it's got a lot of substances in it that are not safe to go in a landfill or anywhere else. Down the drain? Down the drain, especially. Ah, so okay. um, so these are just things that you find in your house. Things like cleaners, uh, medicines, light oh, bulbs. Yep. But these are all things that I like to call troublesome trash. You don't know mm. what to do with it. You know you can't throw it away. But we are here for this specific purpose, to take this type of material so that it stays out of the landfill and we can get rid of it safely. So you get rid of it, I'm sure, by capturing it and, and right. getting it processed, but there's right. also stuff on the shelf, so if I needed just a little bit of something, absolutely, I could just come and grab a bottle? Exactly, and that's wow. really the, the best thing you can do with this type of material is use it, use it up. So I'm here talking with Matt Seelan. He's the superintendent of golf courses here at Notre Dame's Warren Golf Course, which has been certified by Audubon International um, as a conservation space. Why are you doing this on a golf course where I might just be coming out to golf and hang out with some friends and have fun? Why get Audubon certification here? Well, um, I wasn't here during the original certification process for the university, but my understanding of it was a way for the university to separate themselves from other facilities throughout the state of Indiana. Um, as you're aware, we're, we're one of only eight facilities certified in the state of Indiana which we're extremely excited about and very proud of. And we feel it's an obligation that we maintain the golf course and such that we um, monitor and maintain the habitat for wildlife in our area. We, uh, we maintain upwards of 60 acres of wildlife habitat. And what I mean by that is our, our natural areas that are adjacent to most golf holes. Um, there is a little bit of selective uh, invasive weed removal but besides that, we leave those areas alone. 
Um, obviously, golfers find their golf balls in there, and it may be more difficult from time <laughs> to time. But the reality is, from a visual standpoint and a building of habitats for wildlife and, and several different creatures, it's, uh, it's a conscientious decision that we're making to promote their life. So healthy for the wildlife, but also healthy for us while we're out here golfing, or I could come out here birding. Absolutely. So we're going we're gonna to go out on the golf course, and we'll see a couple of areas such as the Jude Creek area. Mm -hmm. um, Great. So, and then we also have a natural wetlands area that we can mm -hmm. go out and we can take a peek at, and chances are we'll probably see some wildlife in one of those two areas. So these are called buffer strips, and they're put in place to control any kind of runoff from the golf course into the water. And then it's also to try to keep any invasive weed species from growing in this area. So they oh. only receive two things, two treatments all year long. They will receive a treatment to take out the invasive weeds, and then they will also receive just a little bit of a haircut in order to kind of maintain the aesthetics of them. But besides that, we leave this to go all natural for protection of the waterway. So even though you're using some more natural products on the greens, whatever runs off, we don't want to overwhelm the creek. So this helps filter that out. Absolutely. And it looks like a lovely natural habitat. There's birds swooping all around, and I understand you've had all kinds of critters running around out here. Absolutely. It's a haven for deer, and it's a haven for ducks, and you'll get to occasional geese that'll come through. But actually, in the waterway itself, um, there's some trout. We've, oh, we've, wow. we've seen brown trout run through this area and even some rainbow back in the day. But we're not fishing out but here right fishing. now. No. Yeah, but okay. it's all for natural habitat, <laughs> especially when uh, the golfers are crossing over the waterway. It's such a nice feature to the golf course. Oh, it's gorgeous out here. And so you said there's also wetlands hiding in here somewhere too. Yep, that's where we'll be heading next. All right, let's take a look. Matt, this is stunning. This is just a beautiful wetland you've got out here on the course. Uh, you make it look so easy to keep it all natural looking. So <laughs> thanks so much for telling me all about what you're doing here and uh, keep up the good work. Thank you. We are actually standing on something that looks a lot like this. Yes. Wow, how did that happen? And how does that work that we are standing on trash? Yeah, so the Elkhart Environmental Center is an environmental learning center, but our past is really kind of interesting the fact that we're on an old city dump. We were an old city dump from 1960 to about 1983 and we have 15 feet of trash underneath us and so uh, we've created this really interesting uh, demographic to, to showcase that. But what's on the very top that keeps this away from us? <laughs> yeah so uh, 33 acres of our now 66 acres property is the original dump and so 33 yeah. acres has an immense amount of trash underneath it. Um, so it was pre-landfill uh, guard, so we don't have any liner on the bottom. So what we did was called in-situ capping, which is clay capping on the top. And um, so there's a clay cap that's a few feet deep in total and uh, covers the whole site and it really protects uh, us from this. So that keeps the, our groundwater safe, I expect, because that clay is almost like a plastic seal on the top. And yeah, just... absolutely. And then we've put in some really cool engineering design to help us uh, remediate that groundwater even more so, which is pretty exciting. Nice. So ideally, this is an investment in a more sustainable future, saying, here's what we did. Don't want to do that again. Let's make sure that we know generations moving forward that we can do better. Absolutely. Uh, we pride ourselves in being a, a really great place-based educational site for waste education. Um, we've heard from a lot of people that it hits home for the kids and the students and adults as, as well, that they can see visibly uh, what has happened here and how to prevent it on down the future versus the landfill is, is kind of a, an operation in progress and it's hard to see what it could be besides a landfill. So Sure. Yeah, mm -hmm. so we're really seeing the after. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And there has been a lot that has gone in here aside from clay capping and, and planting things, but there's actually some really neat natural water features on the property aside from the Elkhart River, which is, of course, mm -hmm. amazing. Mm -hmm. um, but I'm wondering if you can show us some of the environmental improvements that have taken place uh, on this site as well. Absolutely, yeah. Right. Wow, this is beautiful out here. What, uh, and this wasn't ever here before. This is built on top of the old dump. Yeah, absolutely. So what you're looking at is that wood line out there is the uh, end of the line for the dump. And so we have more property, but up from the wood line up to here is still the original dump. And so we put in the prairies to do some restoration for prairie activity and prairie wildlife. And then 
we've installed a series of wetlands that have really helped us to remediate the water quality out of here. Oh, you were saying you mm -hmm. want to make sure that the groundwater is still safe, so this is part of the natural filtering process for that. Yeah, thing. absolutely. So what we do Beautiful. is we pump the water, the groundwater out of here into a series of different wetlands, and uh, we have, uh, as, the water comes in, <laughs> as the water comes in, uh, the stillness is uh, cleaned by the plant life, and so uh, as it leaves our site, it gets filtered out from toxins and that sort of stuff and uh, heads down to our uh, meandering creek. So, Wow, beautiful. So we're creating a lot of habitat, but also giving back to yeah. our ecosystems. Yeah, here. and really the, it's interesting because we've uh, counted over 86 bird species, 200 plant species here, and so it's provided a secondary benefit of wildlife and environmental um, uh, low impact and so it's been really nice. And again a good investment because otherwise we'd have some much more expensive water treatment issues on our hands. Yep. What a great place to learn about what this part of the world is really like when yeah. we don't put a dump on it. <laughs> there are pears on this tree and it's making my mouth water. Could I just pick one when they're ready or what's going on here with all this? So this whole location here including the greenhouse and our fruit orchard is all a community you pick a vegetable fruit garden um, that's just available for the community to enjoy. Uh, this project wow. was uh, started with the Mishawaka High School Landscape and Garden Club. Uh, a couple of years ago in 2019, we finished construction on this whole area, transforming just an empty space into a high production garden and community asset. Well, and it really is producing a lot. I see beds and beds of food over here and so I could just come and pick food. Yeah so the model that we want to have for this is one that is community engaging and so people can volunteer to help take care of the vegetables here. People can also help themselves to the produce we have. Uh, we have a lot of different items like zucchini, potatoes, uh, different things like that that people from all over the community are enjoying now and people are welcome to help themselves to. One thing I wanted to share with folks about is how they can experience sustainability in action. So we've talked a little bit about, you know, it's fresh, healthy food. That's really important is sustaining people, right? It's also free, which makes it much more economically possible to, to eat healthy. Um, and then there's that social aspect, too, of being able to help out in the garden. You talked a little bit about what used to be here. Can you tell me a little bit more about how this is actually improving the environment here in Mishawaka? So around the greenhouse, as we move our way around there, uh, we have quite a, a mix of different plants to help our pollinator communities. Uh, we get a lot of uh, bee and butterfly activity around the greenhouse, probably more so anywhere else in the city, except for maybe Buter Park, which has pretty extensive mm. flowers as well. Um, so I think that's really one of the best areas. And what's neat about that is the landscape design there was done by the students in my landscape and gardening club. When wow. we planned this, they were really proactive in shaping what would go in. And that was a big component that they wanted to include in this project was a way to kind of help our environment with native plants and pollinators. Well, this is really a fantastic resource, Jake. Thanks so much for encouraging the kids to yeah, carry this dream forward to provide you know great free healthy food for the community a place to learn and socialize and really beautifying the environment so folks should get off the road turn in uh take a look and uh you know hang out have a snack there's some peaches out there too <laughs> yeah they're getting close to being ripe so definitely come check those out cool thanks a lot yeah thank you Hey there, I am standing on the side of the road in Gary, Indiana, showing you how you can experience sustainability in Michigan. Yes, on the side of the road in Gary. You will never have found this on your own, uh, but what we've got here is an artesian well, natural spring water springing forth from the earth. Uh, and I've got Kay and Alva here to help us understand all the exciting features that this offers to developing a sustainable Michiana for all of us. So thanks for meeting me out here at the spring at Small Farms is what it is. But this is a really unique feature you don't see everywhere. That's right. Kay, can you explain a little bit for us how this came to be? This is a, a funky little geologic feature. It is, it's a spring actually that is, can be called either a spring or, or an artesian well. 
and all artesian wells are springs, but not all springs are artesian wells because they're a special kind of spring. Um, there's an aquifer that's usually non-permeable, usually clay or rock, you know, underneath us, and that aquifer has an opening in that impermeable layer that the geology is kind of forcing that water up to the surface and you don't have to pump it. So it just flows and flows and flows. Even during the winter, it's flowing all the time wow. because of this pressure that's happening because of the geology. There's an area where the water's trickling in called the resort recharge area, probably in a higher towards Ridge Road. And that water kind of trickles down to the aquifer and then eventually comes back up. So in the process, it's so. getting filtered through the ground. Yeah. So it's coming out drinkable clean? Well, it is tested on a quarterly basis by, okay. the, by the agency who owns this property, the Little Calumet Basin Development Commission, and they, they have to test it because it's accessed by the public. Mm -hmm. So, so far it's been testing just fine. I've lived all over the country. I've never seen anything like this before. And that's when I learned that for years, at least in my husband's lifetime, um, this was the only source of drinking water for a significant number of people in the area. Wow. And so, but it wasn't always something that they were proud of. It was, you know, you kind of park by the road and you hurry up and get your water and then you hurry away because, you know, you don't have water. And so they weren't necessarily um, appreciative of the fact that this is a, a natural gift. Yeah. It was turned into something that people tried to hide. I mean, there's not that many of potable ones left in Indiana. Like my research, I've, I've found about 50 roadside springs, but only about half of them are still used for drinking water. And there used to be hundreds, hundreds of them. Wow. So, I mean, because these were places that people, when they traveled, they'd stop and get water rather than go to the 7-Eleven, you know, and buy a bottle of water, you'd stop at the spring and get a drink of water. And then the, the community that depended on this spring, I think it's really important to understand, you know, what happens when you don't have access to water because they didn't, if you don't have municipal utilities, you don't have a good well, you have a Superfund site not, not far from, you know, your home, you're, you're left without any resources. And that's, I think, one of the reasons why this is still uh, um, here because people relied on it for so long and it was so important in people's lives just to sustain people, you know. Sure. It was like a gift. Mm -hmm. Yeah, as Alba said, yes. There like are people who come from as far away as Valparaiso yeah. just to get water. And we've seen that in some of our trips over here. Um, I met a man once who the entire back of his pickup truck was giant water containers and he filled them up and he's like, I live in Valpo, but I come here because I don't drink any other water but this. And so for a lot of people, this is still what they drink. They're, there's no store-bought, you know, 7-Eleven, go and grab a bottle. They don't do that. They drink this. There's really something value-added for body, mind, and spirit from this gift just flowing forth clean from the earth. It's yeah. a really fabulous resource uh, and a great way for anybody to just drive by, stop in, fill up a bottle, and experience sustainability in action here in Michiana. The reason this came to be is actually kind of an interesting story that relates to the Canadian goose, which is mm. a problem pest here in Mishawaka. They enjoy turf grass as their main food. They enjoy habitat without predators, and they enjoy the slow moving water. So this is an excellent habitat for the Canadian goose. Uh, and so as an initiative to try and kind of curb their populations and, and manage them as, as a pest. Um, we partnered with the Department of Natural Resources to create uh, this native planting habitat which acts as a vegetation barrier uh, to kind of prevent some goose movement into the park. And so uh, Canadian geese uh, can, obviously they can fly, they can fly over into the park but what we have found is they spend significantly less time or no time at all on the sidewalks, which for us oh. has, has left a much cleaner presence uh, in our park for those that are, that are walking their dogs or just enjoying our parks uh, moving through this corridor here. So this acts as a wonderful space to limit goose movement on our, on our concrete surfaces. The community around this park enjoys this. They like the aspect of seeing increased in nature and they really appreciate the cleaner sidewalks and which has prompted us to kind of expand the scope of this project some. So I think it, it's definitely a, a new image for some of our parks and it's one that I, I think is important that we continue to explore for a few more years to see 
you know, what those benefits are, are going to be for us. So that was a great look back at some of the things. We've done a lot uh, over the years, and we've really had a fun time exploring what is out there and what people can do. So if, if you have one thing to say to the people at home as far as it relates to experiencing sustainability in Michiana, what would you tell them? Well, if you haven't been to these places that were in the kind of highlight reel, um, go check them out. They've, they've been there, they're still there, um, and they're great places to see this in action and start to understand what's possible in terms of putting sustainability into practice. But, you know, keep looking. I didn't even scratch the surface, I feel like. Uh, the more I would learn, the more I would learn. Um, and I hope that everybody gets a chance to go out and find these businesses that are have these practices in place and advocate for these plans with your um, local, regional, state, national governments. Um, and look at your own household too. That's one thing that we never really looked at was like, how can you experience this at home? And that might be fun for like a, a future virtual uh, distance segment is, you know, what can I do at home to be sustainable? Um, so keep at it, it's out there. We've got a lot to experience in terms of sustainability here in Michiana and I'm sure more to come. That's for sure. And so we thank you so much for showing us around the sustainability side of Michiana. And like she said, you know, the way technology is now, hopefully we can catch up, see what you're doing and uh, give us some more tips as far as sustainability goes uh, over time. Now, guys, remember, if you're out experiencing things, even and especially sustainability things, let us know about it. Hit us up on Facebook. Use the hashtag Experience Michiana and we'll find it that way. And until next week, stay safe, everyone. Hi, I'm Krista Bailey with IU South Bend Center for a Sustainable Future, here with another feature about how you can experience sustainable Michiana. I'm Krista Bailey with IU South Bend Center for a Sustainable Future, reminding you that no one can do everything, but everyone can do something. Experience Michiana is made possible in part by the Community Foundation of St. Joseph County and the Indiana Arts Commission, which receives support from the state of Indiana and the National Endowment for the Arts. This WNIT local production has been made possible in part by viewers like you. Thank you.